Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are on the timeline. I am happy to welcome you. My name is Lisa Wolfort, and I am talking today with Sherry Roberts Lumpkin. Sherry is an amazing creator. She has created the Rag Baby Exchange Co. And the Rag Baby Exchange is a nonprofit organization that does the essential work of helping Black girls to love themselves. For me, this is vital work because strong girls become strong women and not strong in the sense of Black women, hashtag strong Black woman, but strong in the sense of our own resolve and love for ourselves in the face of the onslaught of images that are often telling us otherwise. And so I wanted to welcome Sherry to the program Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. For Patreon supporters, you're going to get to see the ever amazing Sherry Lumpkin in the flesh, as well as with an amazing doll behind her. So if you are not a Patreon supporter, why are you not? It's only like $2 a month. I'm pretty sure you got $2 in the couch that you could totally give to Black Women Stitch. Let's be honest, okay? Can you talk a bit, Sherry, about what got you on the doll journey? I started really when I was a kid because I love dolls. I taught myself how to sew by making clothes for my Barbie doll. I had this great box. It was like a suitcase. I remember it was blue with pink flowers. And inside was a Singer sewing machine and a Barbie doll. And I would take fabric and I would make her clothes. And I was just so in love with it. Sometimes would make fabric dolls. Like I was way over the summer with my grandmother in Virginia. And I live in Maryland near Washington, DC. And I was missing my mom. So I made her a little doll. She kept it for years. And sometimes I would look at it and I would go, oh, how embarrassing is that doll? (laughs) But, you know, we had it. And when I think about it, the doll was not brown. The doll was out of a Muslim cloth. But I still made it. And I think to myself, now, why didn't I make that doll brown? But that was all we had. Then cut to the 80s. My mom and I are searching for an angel to put on the top of her Christmas tree. We can't find any angels that look like us. It's like, we don't come in angels? Like, what's that about? Now, this was the 80s. Things are changing. And you couldn't find really nice black dolls. You couldn't find, you know, of course, they had the Cabbage Patch dolls. But it still was a doll that was dipped in brown paint. It wasn't a doll that began from the inside out. I just decided I would make her a doll atop her tree. And when I did, it actually was out of paper mache. It wasn't really out of fabric. And when I did, I got so many orders from her friends, my friends, because everyone was wanting this brown doll to be on their tree. I was a volunteer at a Smithsonian Museum in D.C. It was a community museum called the Anacostia Museum. We had a quilt show and a doll show at the time. They asked me to run a workshop for the kids. And I noticed that most of the kids who were BIPOC, let's just say, brown and black kids, were creating dolls with blonde hair and blue eyes. And, you know, not that Blonde hair or blue eyes is an issue at all. Some Black people actually have it, and there's an African country where a lot of them may have that. That wasn't the point, but what the point was is that they were choosing this because of the narratives of the media and the people and racism and colorism. And I would talk to them and I would say, oh, I love your... I love the beads in your hair. Can I make this doll look like you? Can I make her dress like yours? Can I help you to create a doll that looked like you? And it was boys and girls. And what I noticed is that when I helped them create the doll, because they were apprehensive at first, but when I helped them create it to look similar to them, because, you know, it's abstract, kind of fell in love with this thing. 
And when they were like holding it, they were just like giggling. And I said to myself, wow, there's something there. I need to research how this affects self-esteem. Of course, you know, we already knew about the Clark study with uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. And so I looked back at that and I started researching what it is to have self-esteem and self-worth and how does it affect you and your growth and how do you get it? Over the years, I just added what I thought really made sense to become a more healing workshop. You said something really beautiful when you were talking about the decorating your Christmas tree. Now, for those of us who celebrate Christmas and when you have the tree in the house, the tree itself is a symbol. The tree stays up for a long time. The tree is a reminder of the joy of family and bringing together traditions and gifts. And you might hang an ornament on a tree that you've had for generations. Like it's celebratory. And it's ceremonial. Since when you said, what, we don't come in angel? That is the key. If we cannot find an angel that looks like us, why are we going to put someone who doesn't look like us at the pinnacle of this important celebration? So like when we put the angel on our tree, you know, for many people, at least for myself, you put it on the top and that's the start of the season, right? It's like, okay, it's here. Christmas is here. The tree is done. We're ready. The angel is here. She is looking over us. She is watching out for us. And to have it be brown, just like everybody else in the house, as opposed to not, you know, like if we are not allowed to see ourselves reflected in the most intimate, private moments of our lives and our family lives. What does that mean for us? And I think it does indeed go directly to self-esteem. There was a quote from a Black theologian who said, a people who worship a God who does not look like them are doomed. I just thought that was such a staggering to think about, right? Because this is something that Black folks are apparently expected to worship a white Jesus. White people don't worship a black Jesus, but you know, so like that was interesting. And then another quote I've been thinking a lot about in my mind that relates to your project as well from Malcolm X. And he says, only a fool allows his enemy to educate his children. And you can see the effects of that in one of the workshops that you did. I want to talk a little bit about the one that was from 2018 when you were featured as part of some action support network program as part of a TV station. Can you tell us a bit about that? That It was a really beautiful story. Uh, so that workshop was done in an area that is considered an impact area that, you know, where people may need more services or help, not necessarily poor, but an area that just needs more uplift and all kinds of things given to it because it's pretty much more. And the community center uh, let me do a workshop there. I I did it for free because I really wanted to help the girls. They were so beautiful and sweet. It was black and brown kids there. And we did the workshop. And one of the ways that I do the workshop, one of the steps to this workshop is releasing negative self-talk and replacing it with positive affirmation. And when we release the negative self-talk, we are actually writing it down. And we sometimes we put it on top of a mirror because, you know, the mirror is the window to your soul. If your soul has junk covering up, you can't really see the truth. I had them write down these things that they needed to release. It's almost like if you have a sticky on your back in school, somebody says, your friend says to you, oh my God, somebody put this sticky on here that says I'm with stupid and they tear it up and throw it away. You're walking around the rest of your life thinking, wow, wait, am I stupid? Even though you may know you're not, but you might question that, you know, from time to time. And that just becomes some junk inside of you that you need to release and weed out. And so the exercise of writing it down to release it is amazing because they wrote things like, I wish I wasn't fat. I wish my skin wasn't so dark. One little girl is saying, I wish I was smarter. Why am I not smarter? Another one may have said something about her hair not being straight. It's like incredible that you are eight years old and you have these thoughts. I think they were eight to 11 and you're eight years old and you're saying, I wish I wasn't fat and why isn't my skin lighter? And that is in the narrative of the world, right? The narrative, not just in America, but all over. And so we had them 
take those, know that they were releasing them and we would tear up these things they said, but not just tear it, but like with a vengeance, we tear it, we tear it. We like make it to little tiny pieces. I collect them. I make sure that they don't lose any because I often tell kids and we do this with adults as well, but I make sure I tell kids that it's like kryptonite. If you lose a little bit, it can still get you. You should see them. They're racing. The, if they drop the piece, they get it, man. They're like, oh, no, get that up. It's like the little. So we throw it away. When we do women, sometimes we're able to do in a space we may burn it. But when we do kids, we actually are throwing it away. Or sometimes we put it in a, a glass, a clear glass of water and let it melt away because you can see the ink pen beginning to melt because, you know, what water's healing as well. And then we rewrite those things that we said into an affirmation. And we make sure we use the term or the, the phrase I am. And talking about, you know, spirituality, this is not a religious or spiritual class. But the idea that the term I am is divine. Using a negative term after the words I am creates it because it creates what you're saying. I am fat. You become what you begin to believe. After I make sure I let them know that after the term I am is when you need to add what's positive. I'm not saying that you have to lie. I'm not saying that if you are overweight and you need to take care of it before health reasons, that you don't recognize that you are, but you write it differently. You say, I'm worthy of taking care of myself to build the beautiful body that I am. You change this into a positive statement. And once I get them to do that, I have them write those. And in writing them, the copy written or patent pending, um, or what we'll say trademark idea of the Rag Baby Exchange is, is that we are stuffing these right into our bodies, right into the doll that we are creating. Sometimes we'll do notes to our younger self. I worked with a juvenile detention center and it was with young girls. They're like, I'm not doing a doll making. I'm in, I'm in jail. <laughs> but they were told to do it, voluntold to do this. And they went through the workshop. And by the end of the weekend, they could speak on their experience. And one girl got up and said, I did not want to do this workshop, but I was forced to. And as I was doing it, I realized that no one has ever put love into me. And right now I'm stuffing love inside of me. I have a daughter who was created in rape, but I kept her and I want to make sure that I put love inside of her. So I felt like that is where I get my inspiration to continue because I knew they weren't going to say anything about my workshop because I was just like, let me sit over here and eat my snacks because they were saying great things because they had people who were doing poetry and people who was, they were just all like the tough love and the get it, get it done. And mine was the sweetness, you know, but when she said that, I almost choked on my food. I was like, <laughs> tears running out my eyes, you know, it just was like, and then people clapped and it was like, wow, there's an impact. There is absolute impact. And I love the question that you start with when you ask the girls at the community center, and I'm not sure you did this at the detention center as well, that what does your inner doll look like? What yeah. does that look like? I am going to ask you to build what your inner doll looks like. What does that question open up for you as an artist and as a teacher working with girls in this capacity? You're listening to the Stitch Please podcast, and I'm speaking today with Sherry Roberts Lumpkin about her fantastic project, The Rag Baby Exchange. When we come back, we will hear the answer to the question that I asked Sherry about her inner doll. Stay tuned and we will resume after the break. Black Women Stitch and the Stitch Please podcast are happy to announce that we have another way to connect with our community. In addition to the IG Lives that we do every Thursday at 3 p.m., we also now have a club on Clubhouse. That's right, friends. They done messed up and given me the chance to have a club. Follow Black Women Stitch on Instagram and now on Clubhouse Thursdays at 3 p.m. on Instagram and 3.45 p.m. on Clubhouse Eastern Standard Time. And we'll help you get your stitch together. Welcome. 
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are continuing our amazing conversation with Sherry Roberts Lumpkin, and we're going to find out a bit now about what her inner doll looks like. My mother is beautiful. I mean, I know everyone can say that about their mom, and my mom is darker than me. And as a kid, she was told so many unkind things about her color, just like so insensitive. And then I remember her, whenever she would buy a Santa Claus or something, she would paint it brown. I remember thinking to myself, she's working on what's inside of her. That She was just not even thinking about it, but she was doing it for us, but she was also working on herself, right? Because she still had some issues with being dark. No matter where she goes, people just die over her beauty. So I'm like, she doesn't even get how beautiful she is because she didn't know. What I thought when I saw her doing that, I think I've come sort of full circle because I had issues of self-esteem at 15 and I was a model for a major department store that I traveled around. The, the I think we went from Virginia, D.C., Maryland to Pennsylvania I was hired as a model and I still didn't know. It's like I wanted to do this, but I mean, it helped me build a little self-esteem, but I still didn't know that I had. And everyone has this beauty inside. You're just the television, the magazines, the narratives all around. They destroy it for you. And then, you know, then you have to compete with people you know, all of the whitewashing that has happened over the generations, the scientific studies, or even the way they say angry Black woman, the strong Black woman, the magical Black woman. The, I do think we're magical. Our magic is not for the use of white people. We're not like a magical lamp that you can rub it three times and then magic pops out. Black girl magic is for us. One of the things that I would notice is when I would get made up, I have a softer look. All the makeup was always done the same. It was always a rough, hard look. And I, I don't particularly like that. I think some women look so beautiful in dark lipstick, but it wasn't always for me. If it's for a spread that is about something, that's one thing. But to always make me up hard when that's not my look, that it's just because that's what they think is supposed to be done. I think that the whole image of us, even to the point that we don't feel pain, like go to the doctors and they tell you that you're not. And it's just such, like you said, when you were looking at some of my stuff, you got a little sensitive. They don't think that we're sensitive. And I mean, I think that more and more people know and understand and it's growing. However, I think this is a, a narrative that is sort of universal about us. And one of the things I love about what you said, and you said so many wonderful things. One, the notion of colorism. Colorism, is, as I see it, is internalized white supremacy. It's essentially taking that same white supremacy hierarchy about light is right and turning it onto ourselves. And this is one of the, you know, in a religious sense or a Christian sense, some would say this is a trick of the enemy. Right. Or we or we just call it gaslighting today that we are meant to somehow believe all the things that we have been told about us rather than trusting our own instincts, our own aesthetics, our own judgments, our own values, because it's much easier for white supremacy to operate if we cooperate and do some of the work for it. And we do some of that work for it when we're saying, I wish I was lighter I wish my hair was straighter. I wish, I wish. And that's one of the things I absolutely love that you get the girls and the women in your workshop to recognize and to pause at the answer to the question, what is your inner doll? What does that look like? What does she require? What does she need? How do you nurture her? How do you nurture her? Because no Black woman, in my opinion, is well served by the racist narratives designed to confine us. And I find that white, not just white people, but this white people for the sake of this conversation, often are taught the same things that we're taught. A lot of times, I don't even think they are conscious. And that's why during this awful pandemic, the four or five pandemics that we've had, one including racism, their eyes have been opened. I remember in working for a magazine and I was a worker. I was in my 20s. 
Another one, another black woman worked there too. And she was darker and bigger. And then there was a white girl who happened to be Jewish. She said to me, why is it that I just find you so much more attractive and appealing than her? And I am still like a little bit teary eyed. As a young person, I did not know how to answer it. But then it came to me and I said, obviously because what you have been taught is why you think that. Only because I am closer to your complexion than she is. But had there been a girl that was lighter than me here, you would have found her the more attractive one. And she was like, I know, I just think that you're prettier. I'm like, that's not it. That's not what you think. That's what you think you think. But what it is, is you're choosing by the level of colorism and racism that makes you think lighter, closer to you. Hair was permed at the time, you know, closer to you is what's more attractive. Not that I'm prettier than this woman. Right. I think that's very insightful for her to even have recognized that what she's stumbling upon is racism and how racism shows up in her life and in her mind. It seems to me that to verbalize the question, it's really a question she'd be asking herself. That's not a question. It's that that's not a question for you. They always come to us to fix it. What I've been saying now, we can't help you find how to get out of racism. They're saying more and more of that now about why read a book. Don't come to us. <laughs> it out. You know. Yes. Yes. Or one of the things I've been saying lately is that I refuse to spend my life explaining white supremacy to itself. <laughs> Yeah. Like this is what you are doing and why it's hard because I'm a much less patient than you are or maybe than you were. Maybe I was much more when I was 20 as well. But now I'm just like, I don't believe that anybody doesn't know these things. I just refuse to believe it. I learned it. I knew it. I live in the same country that you live in. You have got to know this is a thing. I don't know, but you have privilege and it's not on your mind. The only thing that's on your mind is you. I mean, yesterday parking... <laughs> Someone just opens their door and I'm stuck in the middle of the street. He just looks at me and he goes, police behind me, all these people behind me. His door is wide open. He's pulling out kids and wifey and and just be like, okay, I'm done now. You can go on. Not let me get back in the car so people can get around and then I can open the door. But he just swings the door open without looking. It's a privilege that they have that they're not even aware that you are just being rude or you, it's not about you right now. Yes, it's about the public and the flow of traffic that you are absolutely interrupting and your raised finger is not enough to stop it, except that it did. I wanted to ask also about, I'm just so excited about the corrective nature of this project, that it is correcting so many things that have been distorted. It's correcting so many untruths. It's correcting so many of these things and in really intimate and personal ways for the Black women and girls and femmes who take your workshop. I really love to see that transformative process. And it's the beginning of a door because once the door is open just a little bit and someone can say, I realize no one has poured love into me, or I realize that. I am deliberately and fearfully and wonderfully made that I have this and who is being served by me thinking small. I love that idea of somehow recalibrating Black women and girls' love of themselves through the work that you are guiding them to create. And that is something that I think is so worthy of recognition and celebration. The way that you are bringing life and light into this process. Can you talk a bit more about, I I know, for example, some people talk about, well, sewing is my therapy, sewing is therapy. And I say therapy is therapy, but what I see you doing is an actual therapeutic process, a process of care, a process of love. Can you talk a bit more about that? Well, that process is very interesting. Oftentimes we'll have the rainbow of dolls. And when you have a certain amount of participants, you can't always get their skin tone color because sometimes that is insulting to people. They may not want that. Um, But now that I have a box, a a kit, I'm able to ask them and they can tell me because they want to get the color they want. However, if you go into a social services kind of situation, you just need to bring enough. And say you have 15 people and you bring 25 dolls and then you let everyone pick 
and say there is like a light, a, a beige color and a white color, and then there's a dark color left and you're my color or a little lighter, maybe a little darker. What color do you choose? Oftentimes they choose white. Oftentimes they choose beige, but hardly ever do they choose the dark. And then you ask, you know, you let them choose and you don't, you don't try to embarrass them, but it's a, it's an opportunity for a conversation. And so when everyone gets back to their space and they're ready to start, I'll just ask the question. So why do you think you chose your doll color? So I'll let people tell me why they chose, Oh, this looks like my skin color. And you could see a person becoming uncomfortable with their, their choice, you know? And so when you get to them, and they'll say, well, one little guy, I was in, I was in Cuba with Afro-Cuban kids. And the little boy goes, he has a white doll. And he goes, I chose white because white is purity and white is peace. And I said, why don't you choose your color and make his clothes white? And you can express purity and peace. <laughs> he actually responded well, but it took some work because we talked about the, just the color black and white. I started asking the kids what it meant to them. And lots of kids were saying black was negative, black was mean, black was dark, black was cruel, white was precious, white was this. And then I started to explain to them about the fact, because I think one guy said black people were slaves. And I said to him, well, actually they weren't slaves. They were Africans who were enslaved. And I had to, and I, I don't speak Spanish, so I had an interpreter. And then I had a friend who also speaks Spanish fluently. The interpreter was actually a white Cuban. And my friend, she's a, she's a black woman who lives in the States, but she speaks Spanish. She had to correct the translator because she couldn't find the words to say enslaved, right? And so my friend Lori had to keep correcting her until we got it right. And then that same little boy, when I said to him that they, that you weren't slaves, you come from kingdoms that had kings and queens and civilizations that were smart and intelligent. And these people were stolen. His eyes lit up and he was so excited. And at the end of the workshop, he said, I have never known that I come from descendants of kings. I'm so excited. I've never done anything like this. And so these are the kinds of things people just aren't taught. You know, they aren't taught their, their heritage. We don't know our heritage. We don't know our lineage. We don't know these things. But the idea that you could have just been an African in the tribe, but you had a king somewhere. And again, the work that you're doing is corrective and healing because of the way that anti-Blackness works globally is to ascribe all sorts of negative meanings to Blackness and to Black people and to dark skin, and which I find one of the amazing, the amazing tricks of white supremacy is that rather than, like, this is to turn slavery into Black people's shame. Slavery is not Black people's shame. Slavery is white people's shame. They're not ashamed. They raise statues to enslavers. They name universities after enslavers. These people are the ones that enslaved and tortured and raped and abused for generations. And yet they get to be proud of their heritage and all the money that they extracted by raping and robbing and stealing and violating us. And we are left with not just the huge wealth gap and income gap, we're also left with this shame that somehow this was done to us. Generational trauma. This is one of the things, and it's in our bodies. And these are one of the things that we work on with the doll as well. We have a moment of finding, you know, just taking the time to find where the pain is and maybe making a stitch where that pain was and then blessing it with a flower or a heart in its place because generational trauma is real. I, I tell you, one of the things that I had a workshop at a camp in the morning time, we would have a conversation with the boys and the girls. After the conversation, then the boys would go off and do a workshop, then the girls would do my workshop. This was just for one week of the camp. The camp went longer. And so when we got further into building the doll, one of the little boys said to a girl, that doll's not cute. You look like an African and you bald headed. This is what he's saying to her. 
And, you know, I could see she was fussing back at him, but I could see her pain. And I, I just said, wait, let's just stop this right here. Let's talk. First of all, to the girl, I said to her, why is if somebody says that you look like an African, A, why is that an insult? And she just looked at me and she's like, they're always saying, you know, they tell you that you're black and, you know, that color, is, that brown color is ugly. And they look like you look like an ugly black African because Africans are there, you know, they're backwards and they this and they that. And I was like, who told you they were backwards? What color do you think Africans are? They're all like this ugly, dark color. And I'm like, well, dark colors are not ugly first. But second, they come in all colors, just like we do in the United States. African is a whole lot of different countries. What country are you speaking of? I mean, I had to educate them. And I, then I said to him, why do you think Africans are ugly? And more important, why would you call her bald headed? And he goes, because she don't have no hair. And she's, I was like, well, wait, we're not talking about her right now. Maybe it's a girl that has alopecia. Maybe it's a girl who wants her hair cut really short. Maybe it's a girl whose hair won't grow. And then I said, do you laugh at girls that wear extensions? Yeah, because that's stupid. So you don't like bald headed girls, but you don't like girls who have try to make their hair long like you like. Why not? And he was like, I said, they're only trying to please, unfortunately, you. <laughs> And you're a kid. So imagine an adult, what she may be going through. And so he's looking at me. He's so confused. And I said, the thing is, is that when you see hair short in Africa, it's really done on purpose. It started with the colonizers because they didn't want them to come to school with their hair out. They had to cut their hair short. In the United States, they had to wear a rag on their head because they didn't want to see their hair. They had to cover up their hair. And he's, his eyes are wide. I mean, I think he's um, 11. His eyes are so wide. And, you know, he just was like taking it all in. So he looks at the girl and he says, I'm really sorry. I don't think you're ugly. I just, this is what I always say. You know, those are the things. Your hair is short and you're dark, but I don't think you're ugly. Then at the end of the camp, at the end of the week, I'm packing up some of my products and stuff, putting it in my car and he's helping me. It's more than one boy helping, but he's helping me too. And he stays at my car and he says, I will never call a girl all headed again. So like, I will never, ever think about that again because I have learned how beautiful they all are. And he was 11. If you can change that at 11, imagine the man that he is becoming. Now, this was a few years ago. You know, he's a teenager now. So I'm like, imagine that. That is that he was taught to because they think that the pictures that you see, I mean, it's getting better, but there's always been this thing about Africa. If you see something beautiful about Africa, it's the land and it's the animals. And you see white people in these white outfits with, you know, hats and they're walking through. It's beautiful. When you see Africans, they are, you know, dancing. They do dance and they do have rituals, but this is not their life. They have whole cities that they've created. And Africa is not a country. Different countries, all a continent of Africa. It's different places. What you're being told is not the truth. One thing about if you see a movie like Tarzan, it's like, really, how could it be? Really, how could that possibly be that a white man can talk to the animals and all of these black men around him, they don't know how. Like, it's just like, it's just so ridiculous. It is violence. And to market these ideas to children and to reproduce these colonial narratives that always try to get folks to sympathize with the oppressor. And that's what's in that insult of you look like an African, you look like you look black, you look black kids call it black kids. Black as me, black as you with mamas as black as me, as black as you calling somebody black as an insult. African. As an insult. It's appalling. And it just shows that the work that you are doing is so important because it is correcting and guiding these children to a better version of themselves based in love. Because it's so much contempt out there that's available. And that's why you have eight-year-olds saying they wish they were thin. That's why you have 11-year-olds calling somebody African as an insult because they have inherited these racist narratives that they also then believe, right? And it's so harmful. And the beauty of your work is that you are speaking to children 
to young people in language that they can appreciate. So making a superhero doll, making an angel that looks like them is something that is helping them from within and helping, I think, the community itself become more strong and robust and resilient, that you are giving them counter narratives that are equipping them to move forward in ways that are powerful and in ways that are that are keeping themselves at the center of a loving story of their life. That is something that is so priceless and so difficult and so precious. And I'm grateful to you for doing that. We are going to have to wrap up now because where did the town go? We didn't get to talk about everything. So this just means you have to come back. This just means we have to get to come back and have another conversation about this amazing work, about all that you are doing. But I'm so grateful to you. Can you tell us where folks can find you? How can we follow you on social media? How can we support this amazing project? Thank you. It's so great. You can find me on Facebook at the Rag Baby Exchange, also on Instagram, Rag Baby Exchange. Then Twitter is Dolls Make Peace. And then my website is R-A-G-B-A-B-Y, Rag Baby. Then it's E-X-C-H dot org. And the website really needs some work. So we are trying to upgrade it. You cannot donate on the website at present, but you can contact me because I am a nonprofit, a 501c3, to contact me to pay other ways. And I would love it. So thank you. Yes. So y'all, I'm going to put all these links in the show notes. So you'll be able to click to find Sherry Lumpkin and to connect with her, to support her with financial resources and any other aspects that you could, well, financial resources, let's just stay with that. I could say, oh, people can send you fabric. No, she doesn't want fabric. Send her some money. If you send money, she can buy the things she needs. So thank you again, Sherry, for being with us today. I'm so grateful to you. This was wonderful. Thank you. I love it. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. I'm honored to be here. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really, really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcast directories or services allow for reviews, but for those who do, for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments, if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the Stitch Please podcast, that is incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together. Mm